and he's had this cough. And this cough is just lingering. Oh, by the way, same thing happened last winter, this cough that went on for a couple of months. Now, to doctors who've studied medicine, this is almost the textbook definition of what used to be called chronic bronchitis. And if that weren't enough, we even added at the bottom, you know what? When you listen to the chest with a stethoscope, you hear noise, you hear wheezes, whistly sounds. Well, that should be a slam dunk. Sounds like it might be COPD. We asked doctors, so what would you like to do to sort out this, this patient? It's hypothetical. It should be pretty easy. You just tell us what you want to do. So almost to a person, they wanted chest x-rays. That was about 80% of the doctors. Well, fair enough. New smoker in the practice, got some breathing symptoms. Sure, let's look at a chest x-ray. This middle one, sputum culture, well, that was doctors looking for infections, and I'm still puzzled about that part. But how many doctors actually wanted to measure that airflow, figure out what they were dealing with? And the answer is about 5%, 1 in 20. And I'll tell you, that study was done 20 years ago, and the figure has barely changed. What's the result? Well, let me show you the result. 20 years ago, when healthcare planners in the United States were looking at their data for two <coughs> common diseases of the lung, asthma and COPD, they said, how many folks do we think have asthma in this country? They said, lots, just a shy of 11 million. How many have COPD? Even more. But how many of the asthma patients do we know about, have been diagnosed, have been found, have been treated? Well, that was most of them. How many po folks with COPD have been found, identified, treated? And that was a small minority. And again, that figure hasn't changed very much, and it's not much better in Ontario or in Canada today than it was in the United States 20 years ago. So how is the diagnosis made? Well, I think you might guess at this one. Doctors, medical students these days all want to look like this guy. And I try to explain to the medical students that that stethoscope is about 200 years old. It's a pretty crude and inaccurate way of figuring out what's going on in somebody's chest. And the real purpose in this day and age for that stethoscope draped around the shoulders is to get the staff discount in the hospital cafeteria. And you probably noticed we don't have a hospital cafeteria, so there's probably not much need for that instrument. We really want doctors to measure what they're treating, not just spirometry, but we want them to get measurements of oxygen when it's appropriate, and so on. And if your disease has only been managed with a wave of a stethoscope, maybe some, something more needs to be done. So why are doctors so neglectful? And maybe this is uh, uh, many factors, but, but sometimes I think doctors are a little discouraged. They say, well, you know, give the patients inhalers, but the obstruction doesn't go away. After all, that was the disease definition. So maybe it's not very, very productive, all this treatment we're trying to give people. So let me pick out one example of treatment and its impact. I'll refer to a study that was published in the New England Journal not long ago. It's been nicknamed the TORCH trial. And if I looked hard in my, uh, my, my uh, references, I could probably tell you what TORCH stands for. I think something like towards a revolution in respiratory care. And don't ask me how they get all those extra syllables in there. However, it was a huge trial, one of the biggest in the lung field, more than 6,000 patients, as you see there. And it was 42 countries, it included Canada, by the way, people who took treatment for COPD for three years. And this is the way doctors outline the design of a trial. Everybody starts with what's called a run-in period. It has nothing to do with exercise, just making sure people are comfortable filling in the diary cards, taking the medicine, making their way back to the clinic. And after that short period, everybody gets one of four things. For three years, they inhaled oops, nothing, or the long-acting airway opener called Salmeterol, or the brand name is Cerevent, or the inhaled steroid fluticasone, brand name is Flovent, or the combination of those two things, Salmeterol and fluticasone, and the brand name in this country is Advair. They kept track of all sorts of things in that long, long trial, but let me introduce you to the bottom line. Because the bottom line is becoming very important. It's not spirometry. It's not how much phlegm. It's really important stuff like whether you live or die, mortality. 
exacerbations? Do you have to spend your time in a hospital bed? Or something that we quantify with questionnaires, quality of life. And we discover with the TORCH trial that mortality is reduced with an inhaler the first time that had ever been shown. Flare-ups were 25% less likely to happen. And quality of life was significantly improved, the arrows going in the up direction. That is, comparing two medicines to no medicine at all. It's pretty exciting stuff. And all of those are very, very important changes. I'm not trying to recommend a particular drug or medicine, simply to say these are important interventions and our comprehensive care, usually with more than just one thing, can make a big, big difference in the treatment of COPD. Doctors need to get the notion they can make some big differences. But is it just a matter of prescribing the right medicines? And of course the answer is no. And everybody in this room, I suspect, knows that it's much more than that. So let's touch on a couple of the other things. Folks in this room, and I recognize many faces, have been coming to the pulmonary rehabilitation program, and that makes doctors think about exercising, and that's certainly a big part of it. We'll come back to that in a minute. But it's also about education and understanding your disease. And here's one of the most basic things to understand, these funny inhalers. Now, some people are using these spray inhalers or aerosol inhalers, or the way doctors have talked about them for years, pressurized meter dose inhalers, but it turns out they're not as easy to use as they might appear. Um, this is a very old slide. It was a study that was done by Dr. Cody and his colleagues way, way back, and they decided they would measure how people were using their inhalers, and they did some clever things. They took a pressure transducer and they drilled a little hole in the mouthpiece of the inhaler and when people inhaled, they would see a pressure swing, and that's what it would look like, so they'd know somebody had inhaled. They took another pressure transducer, they just snapped that on the canister, so of course when the canister was depressed, when the aerosol sprayed, this sharp pressure spike said, our patient has sprayed his or her inhaler. And of course what Cody and his colleagues wanted to see was this correct technique, that is, Somebody would breathe in slowly and deeply, and somewhere near the beginning of that breath in, they would spray the canister. And of course, Cody and his colleagues saw that in the patients they surveyed. But they saw some variations. They saw, for example, patients who were pretty good at breathing in, but who would forget to press the canister. Or they saw people who would press the canister and forget to breathe in, and most commonly of all, People who struggled with timing, timing is everything, they say. People who would breathe in, certainly, and press the canister, but press it much too early or much too late. And it turns out that not being able to inhale all of that very good medicine is a pretty common problem. And here's a quick summary slide of a few of the studies that have been done. Looking across this bottom axis is the percentage of folks who don't use their MDIs adequately, and the estimates in one study were as low as 14%, in another study 89%, but most of us would say, you know what? In a specialized care center like this place, we'd say roughly a third of the people we see are not able to inhale their medicine adequately. They're not getting full benefit from what's been prescribed. But um, there are many, many other aspects of being involved in your own care and being involved in rehab. And of course, we have here somebody who's exercising. It's a nice outdoor picture on a balcony. There's a cycle. There's oxygen in the picture. We've got a patient monitoring his heart rate, although we know usually patients don't reach a heart rate that produces heart muscle training. Nonetheless, that's also a big part of comprehensive care. And I'll just add one word about this picture. This man who's on oxygen probably has some fairly severe COPD. We've recognized that the uh, benefits of rehab are very, very uh, uh, evident in milder COPD as well. And we'd like this to be a part of routine COPD care for everybody close to the time of diagnosis. 
Let me introduce, introduce you to some of the other things that doctors can be thinking about. Here's a man that was referred to us a while ago. He's in his early 50s. He'd been a smoker, not too much of a smoker, by the way, as things go, about 20 pack years, that is roughly one pack per day times 20 years of smoking. And his FEV1, the number that we tend to follow from spirometry, was about half what it was predicted to be.